to this week's edition of uh, Chat Night Africa. Thank you for coming to spend part of your time with us. Again, it has happened in Africa. Another head of state ousted. This time around, Alpha Conde of the West African state of Guinea, Conakry, now a prisoner in the hands of those who were until this morning protecting him. So what happened? Today's incident, today's military takeover in Guinea Conakry is the fourth in just over a year in West Africa. Mali succeeded, Niger's failed. Ladies and gentlemen, while today's broadcast is not entirely dedicated to the military issues or to Alpha Condes troubles in Guinea, the question of whether military intervention in Africa is the solution to Africa's political crisis resurfaces. Thank you for coming on board. My name is Sir Divine Chamukong, and uh, I am anchoring this broadcast from Washington, DC, metropolitan area. My guest on the show today, Professor Edu Abegano, an expert in international conflict management and prevention with a focus on African political institutions and electoral systems design. And Professor Ben Bongang, who has extensive expertise in political science and journalism. He is actually a professor of political science and journalism. These two gentlemen, scholars, will be taking questions from me, but also your questions, because our phone line will be open so that you can challenge them or agree with them. Ladies and gentlemen, join me now in welcoming Professor Ben Bongan. Yes, Divine, it's a pleasure to be back on the show and uh, on an eventful day for the continent. So I'm uh, happy to for us to discuss not only the Guinean uh, problem, but uh, this the problems that seem to re remind us of uh, the coup d'etats of the early 1960s at independence and in, in the 70s. So it's a, a, a pleasure to be talking about these events. I wish I could be talking about the successes of democracy than, than, than uh, issues of military takeovers again. That's Professor Ben Bongan. 
Ladies and gentlemen, with me now on the platform, Professor Edu Abegano. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Divine, for inviting us around this uh, table and panel to discuss the issue that uh, um, facing our continent, especially uh, the recent uh, military takeover and today's uh, military coup. And um, like, uh, as Dr. Bongeng just said, uh, we support to be talking about uh, you know the sources of uh, um, democracy and also the development that is uh, happening in uh, Africa currently. But uh, unfortunately, we have to be discussing uh, the issue of uh, uh, political military takeover, and it is unfortunate. But uh, uh, this is an issue we have to face it and uh, delve into it and find solution how we can uh, uh, prevent the future um, um, conflict from uh, occurring again. So it is my pleasure. Again, my name is uh, Dr. Edo Agbeonu. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Edu Abegano. Ladies and gentlemen, my first shot. My first question is going to the professor of political science and journalism, Dr. Ben Bongang. Here we go. Dr. Ben Bongang, do you believe that military interventions in Africa is the solution to Africa's legion of political crisis? If yes, why? No, I don't think that the military are uh, the solution to Africa's political problems. The problems are political and uh, the military, uh, in my opinion, will not solve political problems because the military is trained to defend the territory. And the military throughout history is not subservient to civilian rule, but the civilian authority should be the one that uh, gives the military directions on what to do for the defense of the country. Therefore, the military is not the solution. Now, having said that, we can also look at why the military, when we look at military in Africa and other places that have taken power, the root causes, why a military takes power, there must be deep political problems within that country. And when there are the other uh, sectors of the of this country cannot find solutions, then the military, because of the, the, the fact that it is one of the organized uh, bodies within the country, and because they control the power in this term, power in terms of military power, they feel compelled to, to be the only source of alternative uh, leadership. Now, why is that the case? Because in the case of, uh, of Guinea today, and in the case of other countries, civilian leaders have not provided a pathway for change of leadership. In the case of Guinea, my understanding is that uh, President Alpha Conde, uh, he uh, decided and found a, an excuse, as it were, to remain in power by revising the constitution and having support from his political elite for another term in office. Of course, that was not what the Guinean constitution said, but the problem is not unique to, to, to Guinea. There are leaders who have been in power for 30, 40 years it is not normal for one country to be ruled by a single person or a single clique of individuals for that long time. And in the case of Guinea, again, it shows that Guinea is not unique. And we might, unfortunately, be seeing similar cases across the, the African countries. When it happens in one place, I think it becomes an inspiration, unfortunately, for other military leaders to intervene. Dr. Ben Bongang, before I bring up uh, Professor Edu Abegano on the platform, you disagree that it's not the solution to Africa's political uh, crisis. 
Dr. Ben Bongang, when you looked at videos that were coming in from Guinea Conakry, people were dancing in the streets. Yeah. Why are those people wrong and why are you right? No, I, I don't, I wouldn't uh, uh, suggest that the dancing is because the, the, the people believe that the military is going to, to wave a wand and then the political problems of the country will be solved. They, they are expressing exasperation just like the military is. You know, enough is enough, they are saying. We cannot continue like this if the country, the problems of the country are not being resolved by the leadership that is there. So they see the military as the only other responsible institution within the country that may solve their problems. But as we have seen from other military takeovers, it is never or very few of them have provided long-term solutions. And I think Professor Edo might have slightly different views on, on, on that one, and it will be interesting for us to talk about it. Uh, if we look at the case of uh, Ghana uh, with Jerry Rawlings, Jerry Rawlings took power and, uh, and, and did what I, I would call a cleansing of the political elite when several leaders of uh, civilian leaders were uh, executed in the beach. And that cleansing, some have argued, gave Ghana a new lease on life, as it were. Well, if Ghana's example today, the fact that Ghana is more or less stabilized, if that contributed in a way to that, then those who argue that the military may be a pathway to solution may be right, but I still don't believe that the military should be the solution. They, they should be a means to create political institutions that are civilian based, that are civilian based, because the military, even if the military is succeeding without creating a pathway to a democratic future, it will not solve long term political problems. Dr. Ben Bonga. This is Voices of Africa at Chat Night. I'm your host, Divine Chamukong, and now we bring up Professor Idu Abegano on the platform to take some questions. Dr. Abegano, do you believe, I'm going to ask you the same question, do you believe that <laughs> soldiers can just pick up their guns when they feel unhappy with what's going on, kick out the guy who was elected democratically or undemocratically? Yeah, I think this is a very important question and uh, Dr. Bongeng touched a very important uh, um, point. Um, when we analyze the tenet of democracy, a military takeover, inter foreign intervention, Two, those two elements are not one of them. So military cannot bring about democracy. They are there for defense. They are there, they are there to protect the population. They are there from uh, any threat, domestic and uh, foreign, and so on and so forth. So the question we have to ask is that, why military are coming you know, to power? Uh, why? They are coming out why they are taking over because the political the political situation fell political leaders are failing their people and uh, since the military are there to defend um, the country against domestic and foreign threats uh, those are political leaders uh, who happen to be uh, the head of state of their respective uh, countries are not uh, doing what they're supposed to do and uh, military as a garant of uh, um, protection of the, 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 the continuity of the state have to bring the order to, 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 to the house. It's what the uh, Rollins did in the 1980s and uh, leading to 1992 constitution. And when he made, he made a cleanup of the political situation and we saw the result today, this is not to say that uh, I'm advocating for military takeover, but sometimes 
it is a necessary mean to bring about a change uh, to um, a status quo. If you look at the charter or the constitution or for every single country in Africa, they have uh, everything neatly done on paper. You have uh, the judiciary separated from the, um, the executive, the legislative, legislative separated from the executive and so on and so forth. We have a uh, separation of power, but we don't have a uh, checks and balances. So all the powers are, hand, are in the hand of uh, uh, the executive and they do whatever they please. And this is not right. If you see the composition in terms of demography, in terms of uh, age of the, um, the population in each country, especially if you look at Guinea, the majority are the youth. The elders are in the minority, but the elders are the, those uh, in power, but they are not providing for the youth, what happened if uh, some people are, re uh, are relati re relatively deprived, other people are getting all the, 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 the goodies and um, others, uh, you know, the majority not, are not having anything. So you are going to see those kind of uh, revolution, that is a military revolution that uh, uh, is going on across the continent today. If you look at Mali, what happened is a young, uh, colonel who take over. If you if you go to uh, Guinea Guinea Conakry Guinea today, what uh, is a, the guy is relatively young. So uh, the leaders are not providing for their population. Is the reason why they are coming to power. But the main problem that uh, ignites those kind of uh, military takeover is uh, our our institution, our organization, regional and. Um, Sub-regional, if you look at ECOWAS, in their charter, they forbidden military takeover. The African Union forbidding that, but they have not provided uh, the means that can uh, uh, prevent those military takeover. What, what I'm saying by that is that uh, when someone take over, um, the reason why they take over, they don't address the issue. They don't address the, the underlying uh, issue of uh, why this is happening here. They just bandage the situation and move on. This is the reason why it's keeping it's keep repeating over and over and over again. So um, the military took over now, I believe, can be one of the way to, uh, to bring about a cleanup that can uh, have some kind of a democratic alternation and uh, I'm not well, uh, asking the military to be... Well, whether yes. they've always cleaned up the place when they come, it's another story. We're going to discuss that because when I listened to what was coming in from Guinea Conakry, mm -hmm. their statements are that there are all kinds of, uh, I mean, corruption, uh, dictatorial powers yes. of Alpha Conakry. They say I, all that. Now, there's somebody I on understand. the line. Mm -hmm. This is Voices mm -hmm. of Africa chat night. Hello. Yeah, good evening, uh, Dr. Beginner. Do you hear the caller? No, 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 I cannot no. hear the caller. Do you hear the caller? Hold on. Emmanuel, do no, you no. Uh, let me make sure that my guests are following you. Do you get the caller, Dr. Abigana, in your, in your ear set? No, 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 no. All right. No, no. We will. Uh, we don't get in there. Just hold the line, please. Yes. Um, just, on. just, I, I, I get back with you. So, yes, Dr. Abigana, yeah, go ahead. Yes, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you look at it, Guinea, you have a military, Daji Kamara, who overthrew Lassana Conte, and uh, later he was overthrown because he become, uh, you know, uh, he see the juice of the power, he doesn't want to go. We understand that. But if we are trying, 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 one day we are going to see someone like Ronis like to, to, to come and bring about uh, change. If you look at uh, almost every country, Social revolution are not bringing about any change because the military or the military in uh, every country, every countries, almost every country has been politi politicized. Uh, okay, in such Doctor, a way that I we have the caller on the line. I think he's calling from uh, Virginia. Okay. Hello, sir. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, 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 Good evening to all the, uh, the people on the program. Yes, we're listening to you. What's your question or what you are, what's your question? By the way, do you believe that the that soldiers just get out of their barracks, fire gunshots, invade the presidency, kick out the president when they're feeling unhappy with what's going on? Uh, yeah, 
uh, to, 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 to begin with, uh, with, before I get to your question, uh, Divine, I want to first of all uh, say that, you know, the, the, the kind of gov governments we have in Africa now is the one that is provocating, is provocative. It, 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 most of the governments we have in Africa now are the ones that they don't take care of their citizens enough in such a way that most of the citizens are so, you know, disgruntled with, 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 the, with these governments. And that is why when there's the slightest opportunity for these governments to be taken out of uh, in place, they don't have any option but for the people to follow what is going on. Do you have, uh, having said that, do you have a question to the panelists? Uh, okay. Uh, well, I just, I just want to say that, uh, or, or, or to ask, uh, what in, uh, yeah, what can be done? What can be done in, in Africa now? Because I know we have a lot of, uh, 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 in fact, what I, what, what I can say is democ the democracy in Africa is at stake. What can be done so that democracy can come back to Africa? Because from the look of things, we, 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 most of the governments, we claim to have democracy, but we don't practice the democracy itself. So what I'm trying to ask or to find out from the panelists is what exactly can be done so that real democracy can return back to Africa? Thank you, sir. Yeah, if I may, if, if I may uh, yes. attempt. Yes, uh, sir, Dr. Benbonga, you first. Yes, I, I think uh, that is the question is fundamental to any political change on the continent because what do we do to bring democracy on the continent? It is probably the question of the century because uh, it. I, I would say it has to concern every body in every country on the continent, the will to play a part in building your country should be the will that propels every single individual, not a group of people who have been elected or so, because democracy should be a process that involves everybody. What do I mean by that? It means that at every level, whatever contribution you make to the country, if you are doing it in good faith to say to serve your country together, it will get to will get to a democratic uh, uh, future, meaning that if everybody has the in their hearts the success of that country, then it can work. Let us take, for instance, those in leadership today, they have been described across the continent as corrupt, and indeed, the majority of them are corrupt. What if they suddenly, it would be a miracle, what if they decided that we want to do something good for our countries? It would mean they would start changing their behavior, isn't it? And what if this surge of the youth, the youth surge, I would call it, on the continent, almost in almost every African country, the demographers are telling us the population of young people is more than any other country on the, in the world, European countries and others. What does that mean? It means that these young people who are coming out, most of them from universities without jobs, will want jobs. They will want to contribute to building their countries. And looking around and seeing people in leadership who've been there for 40 plus years, people who should have been retired a long time ago, hanging on to power with no new ideas to address the concerns of the young people today. It, it means there is no goodwill. There is something we talk about as political culture, meaning how do people see the role of, of those in power? What do they expect the country to be? And that kind of culture is not only what we look for from the leaders, it is also what we 
as citizens expect of our countries. And democrat, democracies uh, grow, as it were, where a culture, a political culture, has provided uh, the avenues for that. And I think we, uh, we, as we talk, Dr. We'll Dr. Ben Bogan, see... I'm, I'm going to push back. I'm going to cross-examine you on that. Yes. You seem to be unhappy with the fact that a lot of African leaders are in power for 40 years plus. Yes. You teach journalism in, in the United States. Somebody's going to question you, what are you saying about members of Congress who have been there some for 50 years? Why are you looking at African leaders? Oh, What's your okay. response to that, sir? Oh, excellent. Excellent question. You know, when you have a, co a political culture like we have in the United States, it means most Americans know what they expect of their leadership in Congress, in, in, in the executive. And because they have created a system where when you, you have, uh, you, you've been voted by your people and there are elections every two, every four years, if you remain in power, it means you didn't force yourself to remain in power. It means your constituency still wants you there, you know? And if they don't want you, 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 you lose elections and you move. You think about the number of uh, American presidents who think, pick any leader in, on the African country today who has been there for 20 years and count the number of American presidents who have come and gone. And you can look, you know, the system here has a judiciary for life. If you are in the Supreme Court, unless you decide to re resign, you can stay for life. There are reasons why they created these separate institutions and created forms of elections. Is the American system uh, perfect? No. We saw from January 6th that it is even a, a, a democracy that has built these institutional checks and balances can also be broken when people perceive that things are not being done right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, ben Bonga. Let's uh, switch over now to uh, uh, Professor uh, Edu Abegeno. Uh, Professor Edu, is the problem in Africa that leaders are in power for a very long time or the way they serve? They use the same argument that, well, if people, people want them. If people want us, we remain there. So why is their own argument wrong and the one in the United States right? Somebody on the line. We have someone on the line. Hello, this is uh, Chat Night Africa. Hello? Yes, sir. This is Voices of Africa at Chat Night. Do you have any questions or comments? Yes, I'm calling from uh, Savannah. My name is uh, Mr. Tometi. Yes, sir. What's your question or comment? I don't have a question, but uh, I'm going to ask you guys a question now about our African democracy. Yes, sir. We are listening to you. So are we, like, as African, I know you guys are really are talking about democracy right now, but are we ready, ready for it? Do we have enough education? Okay. For Just ask democracy? your question. I'm going to turn. That's your question? No, I, no, I'm I have a lot of stuff to say. Okay, please limit it so that others can call in. I so can understand. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that we're ready for the democracy act that the, uh, the European and the United States have brought to us in the past. Because we're young countries, and it's a, it's a really young continent that we have. And I don't think we're really ready for American democracy. All what we need to do first is to educate our people. <laughs> We welcome in the kingdom than democracy. If we can really educate our people from the village to all the cities all across African countries, then we can talk about democracy. Can I ask you a question, sir? Yes, sir. When you say ready, you you can. What are the metrics you use in measuring readiness? I mean, we can't become ripe like bananas, can we? No, no, we can be ready. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. But take a look at when there is a, a luxury, uh, electoral campaign, the people live in the compound or in the village. Some of them can't even read or write. So what do you want to talk about them? What do you want to tell them about democracy? 
What do they know? What, what is the notion of becoming a democracy to them? They have no clue about what we're talking about when we talk about democracy. The oh. only well, because the know the person is from their tribe, or uh, probably they, he, he's somebody who support them financially. That's it. So we are not welcome with the term democracy. I even talked to uh, Dr. Agbonu about that today. We need education first. Without education, a strong education, a formal education, we're not ready for that term democracy. They, they brought that term to Africa about like four years ago. But what are we right now? Look at how our cities and uh, all the, I mean, the village. What are we? Looking all across all these African countries, and especially the French countries, we under corruption, poverty. People are struggling. They're farming. People are starving. They can barely make it every day. And we talk about democracy. I'm sorry, but it's not welcome in Africa. Let's go back to our kingdom back in the days. Before, I mean, all these colonies or French colonies or uh, allies came back. Then we should be, then we, should, we can learn more from them before they come. And then we'll be ready for that, that term democracy. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not meant for us, but it's meant for all these dropping countries, but not for us. No. Okay. Your point has been taken. Uh, if you want to call back, please, you can send me a text and I will always uh, allow you in. Okay. Thank you, sir. No problem. All right. Um, I, I want to tell you, um, professors, again, uh, note the question. Uh, yeah. Gosh, we, we could talk all night on what he has said. No, the whole night. Somebody said that democracy in Africa is akin to sharp knives in the hands of toddlers. Ben Bonga, I'd like you to respond to that, which indirectly addresses the question of the caller. Yeah, I think uh, the, the caller was making a point which I think we hear often about Africa is not uh, ready for democracy. But we, we, we've, we have to ask ourselves, what are we understanding by democracy? Because if we take, just think about what we as citizens want. We want better lives, isn't it? We want uh, to, to know that our leaders are the leaders we select and that we are able to change them when they do not do what we want them to do because the leaders are our servants the people we we, we elect to serve us it's like when you you hire somebody to work for you if they fail to do the job you you move them and that is why in democratic uh, uh, institutions or democrat countries that practice democracy, they create those uh, f formalities or those uh, ways of making change. The elections are one of the mechanisms that are used in democratic countries. But then these same mechanisms are subverted by those who will level themselves democracies and then find ways to, to subvert the process. All right, that's why you, you, you hear about electoral fraud. Why? Because they want to present, okay, we have a mechanism for, for, for democracy, but they find ways to subvert it in order to maintain power. All right, sir, let's hear. I know you, professors yes. of political science, <laughs> if I don't stop you, you're going to go on and on and on. Let's switch over to uh, Professor Abigail. There's a caller signaling from Ghana, uh, Accra, Ghana. We'll take you shortly. Before I move on to asking yes. you to respond to uh, Professor Abegano to what the college just said, Ben Bongang talked about people in the United States. It's okay. Well, their, their constituencies want them to be there for 40, 50 years. Why is their argument right and the arguments of the same argument used by African leaders that the people want them to be in, in power for 40 years? Why is the argument by African leaders wrong? Yeah, uh, um, we have uh, a writer known as Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, he once said that uh, if you want to be free, you need to respect the rule and the policy and the law that you prescribe yourself. So in French, you say, Le respect the law conseil prescrit et liberté. So if um, African leaders want to be in power for life, nobody is preventing them to be in power for life. 
as long as their constitution that they set up that the people voted for say so yeah. they need to follow it yeah why they are changing the the rule in the middle of the game for That's example yeah. if you look at guinea what's happening today if alpha conde resign or um end his term after two terms that the guinean people voted massively in a majoritarian system voted for two term term limits why can uh, alpha conde obey that follow that constitution that he himself signed once upon a time that's the problem if you come here in the united states it's a constitutionally there's no term limit for congress if they want to do it today the people of the United States, the American people, will ask for that, and they are asking for it. And uh, um, lawmakers are thinking about it and are find a way to make the term limit if the time come. In Africa, in the 1990s is when we have democratic constitution in almost all every every countries in Africa. How many of them follow such constitutions? The, the, the question I'm going to ask both of you. The question no, no, I'm going no, to let ask. Let me finish this. Okay. Let me finish this first. All right, sir. Because it's not that uh, American uh, stay in power for long, and uh, America, uh, African people want to be just two, three times. We are saying no, no, because the constitution in the United States is a is a tailor in such a way that there's some term limits for the president, two terms, and you go. For the Congress, there's no term limits. But your people will vote you out if you are not meeting their need in and, Africa. And if so I may make law, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm going to ask you because he raised mm -hmm. a question there, which I would like both of you professors of political science to answer or to address. He says, when there are elections mm -hmm. in Africa, there are campaigns in Africa, the elites mm -hmm. leave the political capitals, mm -hmm. go to the villages, they're talking things that natives mothers and grandmothers and grandparents don't understand so mm -hmm. they're voting based on well is the guy from my tribe is he giving me some bags of smoked fish or salt or dried meat the question therefore comes are we in africa not trying to import what is not adapted to our environment our environment dr ben bonga uh, not at all i think that uh, yeah you you know, in politics, the citizens, like everyone else, wants to see what will make their lives better. And, but they want to see it within a framework that is predictable. You know, uh, we were just saying a moment ago about the, the, the American system. Over the years, the idea of changing or, or amending the American constitution, they set up such a difficult uh, process so that you cannot just wake up each day, any day and say we are going to change the, the, or modify the American constitution. Why did they do that? They want that when there is a, a constitutional amendment, it is something that has been accepted by the majority the supermajority of the people. That is something you build in the political system to ensure stability, which most African countries do not have. What they have instead are when you have a clique in power, they bring together in the legislature and in other institutions of power, the people who are going to deliver things but who will not be solving the fundamental problems of that society? And we can go from country to country to, to see that. And what that does, and it is a form of, of, of politics, it's just that it is not very organized, is that the system uh, drags on, it solves the immediate problems of the elite, but it does not address the fundamental issues of the society. And that is where you have desperation, where you have uh, the military coming like they did today and they did in Mali a few years ago, because there are no outlets. Here you have 
a mm -hmm. uh, outlet for expressing dissatisfaction. And I may just ask uh, add a uh, another thing about the system of checks and balances here. Notice that in Congress, where we said the, the, there are no term limits, there is a mechanism that most people do not understand. When you are a member of the House of Representatives in the United States, you have just two years to prove your worth. If you fail, after two years, you are gone. Now, if you are a senator, your term is six years. And if after six years, you are the state, and it's on the whole state that votes you a senator, if the state still wants you, you are in. That means if you, you, you are elected senator two times, that's already 12 years that you have. But every two years, one third of the Senate is voted in. There are new senators who are voted every, uh, every two years. Okay. And it continues. So you see mechanisms that have been built and accepted. So that but but, but doctor doctor uh, doctor beginner and I'm going to ask you this question and then bring the guy in from Ghana from Accra <laughs> Ghana is lit there, doctor beginner, uh, we hear all the, the the things that doctor Ben Bongang says it it's smooth in the United States, people come to power in Africa whether it's the military or the civilian, and they're doing the same thing. Question to you, sir, is is there a correlation between education or literacy and democracy? It's there seems to be a void yes. in Africa. Yes, Dr. Uh, this is a, uh, today. I said that uh, if we are talking about the tenet of democracy, military takeover is not one of them, foreign intervention is not one of them. Education is uh, a key pillar of a democracy. If you don't understand the issue, you cannot vote, for pre you cannot choose uh, uh, the proper preferences. What do you? you want and so on and so forth, you end up voting against your own interests. You may end up voting for your ethnic group or your tribe instead of voting on the issue. Those are the, the problem that uh, many African countries face, um, especially rural area in Africa. And uh, most of them are left out, are left behind when it comes to education. And uh, that's the reason why uh, it's uh, difficult to, uh, to, to do. And, the points here, when the, that, oh, the just, just hold it there. So our, we have this caller from the Ghana. Bring, uh, it's, let, let, let's yes. take him before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Okay. So when they finish, please, could you turn uh, turn mm -hmm. down the volume where you are? Turn down the volume where you are, sir. You're calling from Accra, Ghana. Yes, go ahead, sir. <laughs> yes, please. We are listening to you. Turn off the volume of your TV. Yes, speak to the phone. Yes, go ahead, sir. All right. Okay. What's your question, sir? Turn down the volume or turn off the volume of your TV or your internet or, sorry, of the Facebook if you're watching through Facebook. All right. I'm sitting in a very quiet place. Okay, go ahead, sir. Hello? Yes, go ahead. What's your question? We can hear you, sir. What is your question? Uh, yes, my question is um, now that Guinea, that the military has taken over, to me, and what is the next step? that Africa, as probably West Africa, will be doing in regards to this political crisis. Oh. Sorry, we're going to have, we've, we've taken your question because of the quality of the line. Uh, we may... What will be the steps? In addressing this uh, West African political crisis, okay. it appears to me that we have a problem. And the problem is leadership. The problem is purely leadership. It happens in Guinea today, tomorrow where? 
what is the future of West Africa now, as we're speaking? All right, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we had to interrupt the call because we, we've got the essence of your question. Mr. Yimbra Foster Bogri, calling from Accra, Ghana, is asking the question, now the coup d'etat succeeded in Guinea Conakry. What next? Where next? If I got him right, these are his questions. Dr. Ben Bonga, I want to address that. Yes, and then, uh, I, I, I don't think, uh, no, I think the, the situation on until at least the, before we went on the broadcast, I would say this, I don't know what success of coup d'etat really means. In the next few days, as things clarify, we'll know what the leadership is, is planning to do. Uh, this new people, I, I've read somewhere, they want to, to talk to some members of the outgoing administration to, to, to maybe to, to decide what, what will be the nature of things. We, I think it's too early to, to know where this goes, but whichever way it goes, I'm not very optimistic for 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 Guinea for obvious reasons because I look at the the the, the various coup d'etats beginning in the 1960s till today very few of them you when you look carefully resolve the fundamental problems of uh, of the society and the fundamental problems of the society even the civilian governments have failed woefully across uh, the continent to resolve. What are these fundamental problems? We have, we talked about education. They are, they are, most of our countries are struggling with, with, with education. We've talked about infrastructure. If you go to some countries on the continent now, almost any, most of them, you cannot even travel to your own hometown because the roads are not there. But then when you see the opulence of those in leadership in the capitals, you cannot believe that it is within the same country. So these are serious problems. The elite in the country, in our countries, have no problem realizing that democracy is about building these institutions and actually making sure they work. You cannot create an elect electoral commission and you have your people who are going to shape things to address the problems in your favor, you know? So those are fundamental issues that, no, we cannot sit here and propose solutions if the will to bring about democratic change is not within these elites who know what they are doing. Okay. And that is the, the tragedy of it. They know exactly that what they are doing is not right. And, and, and they do it, you know, for selfish reasons. Okay, yeah. thank you, Dr. Ben Bonga. Let me go over to uh, yes. uh, Professor Abigano. We're talking about education. Yes. Professor yes, Abigano, I, I mean, with all due respect, I mean, you have, you're a very, very educated guy. <laughs> but I have my worries that if you went back to Togo, you'll be doing the same thing. And why do I feel so? People who came before you, some studied in Harvard, Suborn in France. You can go on Oxford in England. You can go on and on and on and on. They went back to Africa and did not change nothing. I'm saying that people come and go and the status quo remains, yes. which leads yes. me uh, to what this yeah. Nigerian social mm -hmm. critic said, that Africa Africans have no notion uh, of yes. citizenship. This African, what do you call countries in Africa are clusters of tribal groups is that guy right why are you yes. people educated go 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 back to why do you go back to africa and make no changes and things don't change yes the, yes, the education that uh, um the uh, he was talking about he was alluding to it's not the education of the leaders it's the education of the mass that is the the, the difference here uh many african leaders uh, I am very educated, whether it's in Togo, whether it's in Cameroon, whether it's uh, in Guinea. The one who just uh, who was overthrown is a professor, Professor Alpha Conde. He's very educated. What we are talking about, what Dr. Bongeng alluded to, is uh, individual responsibility. It's the people.
people. It's not the leader. Leaders are just few. So once you you discriminated against the the mass when it comes to education, you can uh, perpetuate your your power. You can uh, take your power for forever. The late Mobutu once said, "Without education, there's no opposition." So if you educate the mass, you are going to have opposition. So if you look at uh, when you go to electoral, system, electoral time, the election time when uh, campaign, the campaign season, you are, you are going to see that uh, most of the time, the leaders, the political, the power, the, the party in power, they don't want to allow the opposition parties, whether it's in Cameroon or Guinea or Togo or wherever, they don't allow the opposition leaders to go in the villages, in the rural area, because they are going to spoil them. They are going to uh, tell them the truth and they don't want them to, 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 to go there in order to keep their vote. So most of the time, you are going to see that in those rural area, when the result will come, they're gonna say 100% here and 99% uh, here, but when they come to the, the city, it's about uh, you know divided uh, when they come to the poor. Um, so education is the key when it comes to democracy. If the mass does not understand how to vote, they don't know how to do their fingerprinting to, to select who they want to, to choose, they can choose another person and so on and so forth. So education that we are talking about here is not education of me or any leaders in power, it's education of the mass. And that is a very- You are watching Voices of Africa at Chat Night Africa. In just a moment, we will bring back our panelists, but time for us to stop over in Accra, Ghana to see what's going on there. Watch this interlude of traditional performance. watching Voices of Africa at Chat Night Africa, Africa's voice to the rest of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we bring back our eminent professors, Ben Bongang, Professor of Journalism and Political Science, and uh, Professor Edu Abegeno, who is specialized in lots of things, political science, conflict management, all kinds of stuff. You can tell from the substance of the interventions that they have so much to say this evening. Dr. Ben Bongan, before I bring your colleague back on the platform, the question, we keep talking about leaders. I just had a text to my phone that these leaders don't come from the skies. In other words, we criticizing today from the neighborhoods, when we become leaders, we're doing the same thing. So the question is, is it in our culture to not embrace democratic values or what? No, I don't think uh, it's, it's uh, you know, L let me just take one thing uh, that uh, just to build on what uh, uh, Dr. Edward was saying before I, I, I go into that. You know, just about, you know, what is it that our political leaders promise sometimes? 
when we go, they go for elections and they are talking about what they want to do, Alpha Conde, as an opposition leader, was voted in, you know, and the promise was that if the incumbent were doing such a terrible job, the opposition was going to come up and do things better. But what you see across the continent is that it is very difficult to distinguish between policies that these guys promise. So at the end of the day, it ends up being you vote for somebody you know, maybe it comes from your own region of the country or something to that effect. But there is no very, in very few countries do I see a clear distinction of policies. What is going to be uh, the, the economic policies that this party will adopt as opposed to the ones in the opposition? So that is some missing link in our discussion of issues on the continent. What are we, because for instance here, we know what Republicans stand for and what Democrats stand for, and sometimes where they need to have compromises. But sometimes we don't have that clear distinction. I just wanted to get to that as a way to reinforce what Dr. Edo was saying about education. Because when the people are aware of these distinctions, then they will know here is why I'm voting Democrats today and maybe vote Republicans tomorrow if their policy positions are the ones that will address the issues that matter to me the most. So we have that. But if for that to work elsewhere on the continent, for instance, we will have to go through that long process of building the institutions that we don't yet have today or that we have deliberately refused to build. So if you could say, what, what was the question you wanted me to address again? No, the, before we get to that, we have a call on the line. Hello, this is uh, Voices of Africa. Yes, hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, good evening uh, once more, uh, Divine Jamako. Yes, we're listening to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, what are the it, it's you, by the way. It's you who said that uh, Africa rather be kingdoms. Uh, evening is that. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mr. Awesome. No, it's uh, the, uh, I, I want to. I want, oh, I want to. to okay, it, it's you who said Africa rather be kingdoms than uh, nations or whatever you call it. Yeah, and, uh, I, no, 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 this, no, actually, uh, is is I'm the one who was trying to uh, ask that what is the way forward, you know, for okay. now that uh, Africa, now that we have. Uh, the kind of uh, dictatorial regimes in Africa. What is the way forward for democracy in Africa? Okay, uh, I recall that. I was, yes, I was the one who asked that question. But I, right now, I don't want to ask for the question. I want to. I want to make a, 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 a. I've been following the program for a while, and I want to make a contribution. Yes, sir. Uh, on, on 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 the topic. Yes, go ahead, okay. sir. Oh uh, well, uh, what I just want to say is that. Uh, it, it is it is high time African head of state they practice real democracy. If you say you are a democratic government, or if you say your party is democratically elected, please you should follow what it says. If it is for a five year term, you go in for the five year term and you step down. If it's a seven-year term, you do the seven-year and you step down. You don't go, you, uh, uh, you, 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 you manipulate the constitution, you know, the way you feel it as to what, uh, as, you, as you like. You don't go about uh, 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 creating, uh, you know, bodyguards for yourself because you want to stay in power. You don't go about uh, 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 lobbying for the foreign government like France, what what France is doing? France intervening in intervening in a, a lot in in, uh, in the government in Africa, especially in Fr in French West Africa. So you, you don't go about lobbying for the foreign uh, 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 countries like France or America or whatever or, or China to come and intervene in your government. You do what you want to do 
and you 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 if, if, and you leave the rights for the citizens to decide what it has to be because to be honest with you when people don't practice real democracy that is where they give options or they create loopholes for the military to take over in africa and you will not blame the military for doing that because the military sees it as a, an opportunity for them to also exercise their own power. So when the constitution is firm, when a, 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 a government is democratically elected, and when the term of office is being followed the way it's supposed to be, I bet you we will have real democracy in Africa. If not, the military will keep on intervening in our government. Should the military be trusted? Hello? Yes, should the military be trusted? Well, the military can be trusted in, uh, to a certain degree. I take, for example, uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria. If you look at the period between, the, between 1980 up to 1993, you will see that uh, it, was a, it was a period that was marked by military uh, uh, rule in, uh, in, in Nigeria. And to be honest with you, Divine, take a good look of most of the uh, 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 development projects that have been carried out in Nigeria. Look at uh, the, the creation of the federal capital, Abuja. It was done under uh, 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 Babangida. Look at uh, 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 Motala Mohammed, who ruled in the, in the 80s. Motala Mohammed, created the airport. He, he paved the roads in Lagos. He, he did so much. Look at uh, 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 Sani Abacha, even though he was killed. Sani Abacha did a lot when he came to the federal capital also. Well, uh, if, I, if, I may, if I may push back here, especially when you mention Sani Abacha, Sani Abacha, Nigerians would tell you, was a ruthless guy. He has no stomach for position. No, okay, but, but if you look at what we are talking here about development, if, if, if he, was, he was able to deliver what was what the civilian government couldn't do, uh, look, at, look at the government that came after that came after Sanya Baja. What did they do? They did nothing. Uh, 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 it was only good luck, Jonathan, who in, uh, to a certain degree, you know, did something for Nigeria. Look at Obasanjo. He moved from a military to a civilian and back. Okay. If you look at if you investigate, you're going to see that he did a lot for Nigeria. Okay. So, to a certain extent, I'm saying that the military, it, to a certain degree, has also contributed to development projects in Africa. And I'm taking a case study of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. If you can, we cannot totally condemn the military that they don't do anything. They, in a, in a way, have helped to carry out developmental projects that even the civil, the civilians, or the democratically elected governments in Africa have failed woefully to do. Okay. Thank you, sir. I will leave uh, yes. the panelists to uh, yes. uh, respond me... to you. Dr. Ben Bongang, he seems to be embracing even Sanya Bacha. Yeah. I think uh, what, what uh, the... Our and guest I also is, have uh, Professor Edu to respond. Yeah, after you I know. think what our guest is saying, taking uh, those uh, case studies of Nigeria, I think he's making a strong argument there when he's pointing to specific development projects. But I think uh, what he is probably missing is that we are talking more fundamental issues here. We are saying that our societies, most African so uh, governments, when the military or other groups are desperate, they they find themselves pushing into things that they were into roles that were not created for them. The military was not created to do anything other than defend the country against external and domestic threats. That is the role of the military. The role of the military is not to usurp civilian leadership. Sometimes when they do, like in those cases he cites, they, 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 they do 
make progress, development progress, but that should not be a reason for us to embrace the military. We should mm -hmm. instead say, if what is happening in, in Conakry today becomes again the norm as it had been in the 60s and 70s on the continent, then the, uh, the prospect for democracy in the continent will be dim, And we but cannot be building democracy the on the military regimes. I think I have somebody on the line. Okay, I thought a lawyer and Neneva Kufo was on the line. Let's see. Uh, you're watching uh, Voices of Africa. He's calling from, uh, I think he's uh, there in uh, Georgia. Well, he will call back. Yes, sir. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. You hear me? Yes, please. Go ahead. No, I was just uh, wrapping up to say that the, the, the military, finish, yeah, right? military institutions yeah. or the military, like the the group that's taken over in uh, in Guinea, or the transfer from father to son in in in, uh, in Chad, we cannot use these as the, the bedrocks for democracy. No, we have fundamental political problems, and military rule is not the way to move on to a democratic. I, I got your point. Let's mm -hmm. go over to uh, Professor uh, Abeganem. Professor yes. Abeganem, um, yes, mm -hmm. you want to respond to Dr. Ben Bongang? You don't have to agree with him. It's not a chorus. No, 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 no. It's not yes. that I want to respond to Dr. Mm -hmm. Bongang, but I want to answer the question, you know, the way forward. Um, yes. That's the, um, uh, our auditors uh, have, uh, you know, has asked. Um, First of all, when you talk about democracy, that's a, you know, we have to make a difference be between democracy and development. The, the democracy can lead to development, develop democracy. So that is a two-way uh, arrow, symmetrical three-way arrow. So, but uh, the point that uh, um, our caller was uh, uh, missing is that, you know, you don't develop at the expenses of the people. You don't de develop by uh, just uh, abusing your people, by killing your people, by torturing your people. Torture is uh, not an element of democracy. When you want to democracy, you want people to be free. You want people to be to do, to do everything fairly, and so on and so forth. And um, the when you one of the way forward when it comes to democracy in Africa, first of all, have to come first of all from the political leaders. Political leaders they created their, their political party. They are not democratic themselves. What they do, they create a party as a pri private uh, enterprise. The political party is supposed to be something for public. That you have to be an institution that is a public for the public. You create the political party. You have a, you have to have a term limit. You have to have a time for to serve as a as a founder or president. When your time come, you leave it for the the next generation. But if you look at every single a country, almost every single country, the one who created a political party become president for that party for life. How can that person one time one once he become president know what the term limits mean or what the term in the office mean? Because he's not practicing it. So one of the way forward to establish democracy, we have to have our opposition leaders to be democratic themselves first. The second one that Dr. Bonga talked about is the institution. We talk about education. We learn from the worst. We learn from our ancestors back home. We are educated, whether it's Africa or um, um, in the in the worst. We are very educated. But the problem is not the leader, the 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 person in power. That is the problem. It's the system. Once the system is corrupt, once the system is not in place, you can change the leader. Another person will come will repeat exactly the same thing. Um, and also, we have just to learn from mind, Just hold it there. There's yeah. somebody on the line. Hello, this is okay. uh, Voices of Africa chat night. Panelists, they so educating. So um, I've listened to them, and they are very um, so much on the point. And um, what I was looking at, and what I think is, uh, when I look at American history, I look at Madison. And I look at how they coined the American heritage that we have here today. They talk of the opulent minority, which is like the ruling class 
and they have to maintain that particular class till the end. And if you look at uh, Professor Sheldon Wallen in um, his book, uh, Democracy Incorporated, you know, he reverses it, which is quite different from classical democracy, which um, all these institutions back, they've been ruled by corporations and all that stuff. And I know the, the other professor, not Professor Bonga, talked about uh, uh, Mr. Uh, the, the current president of Guinea, who has just been dethroned. He's a professor, he's a very learned person. I mean, he started in the West, went back home, and he's doing exactly what, you know, the West wants him to do. So my question to the panelists is, is the democracy that's been imported in Africa or brought to Africa, is it something quite different from what the West practices? And as you divine yourself, you have said it, the way it's done here in the United States or in the Western world, why is it different from what is being done in Africa? And again, the other question is, is there a big connection between the military and democracy? Can one really exist without the other? Do you need the military to enforce democracy or can democracy can organically just grow without the military? Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, Professor Abigano, you want to respond, and then uh, Dr. Ben Bongang will uh, continue. Uh, yes, uh, he make an important made an important point, and um, um, the military uh, you had to have a republican um, military re republic re republican army. I'm not talking about republic republican uh, in terms of a republican party. You know, I'm a Republican. You have to have a Republican part, a mil, a, a army to be able to uh, uh, consolidate democracy. It's very important that um, they are there to save the, the, the people, the population, the country, when the country is a, a trouble, whether it's a political trouble or economical trouble or any kind of trouble, any threat coming from outside or inside. So Republican army, it's a very, very key to consolidate democracy, but it's not to um, make democracy to emerge. They are there to consolidate democracy, to make sure democ democracy survive. We need a Republican army. But uh, what we have in uh, Africa, across Africa, we have a um, chronic, you know, tribal army, tribal military, tribal police. This, they cannot work with democracy. They cannot go hand in hand with democracy. Um, because they are going to um, uh, serve uh, the one in power, their tribal mind in power, which is not in line with democracy. In democracy, you don't need nepotism. In democracy, you don't need the corruption, and so on and so forth. And uh, if we can have a, a Republican army, a Republican police, and so on and so forth, that can help you know, consolidate, again, I mean, consolidate democracy, not to make democracy to emerge. So that's uh, a key. Uh, uh, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, okay, you want yes. to- Yes, uh, Dr. Ben okay. Bongan wants to- Yes, take, uh, well, well, one of the things before we go back here that uh, when I look at uh, the challenge that faced the founders in America when they were wrestling with drafting the constitution, one of the key things that I see missing in most attempts to write constitutions is to accept that human beings are weak and can easily be tempted. And that power is not something that normal human beings will give away freely. So what did they do? They, they, when the first three major articles of the American constitution were written, and they went celebrating. Oh, now we now we don't have the king from England breathing down our necks. Now we have an executive, we have a judiciary, we have a legislature. But some were observant. They said, no. If you are going to create a government for the people, how are we going to protect these people from that government if that government becomes so strong and, and becomes authoritative? And the rest of the people said, no, we are not going to sign this constitution until we establish what government cannot do. And that is when they came up with the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. And every one of them says, government shall not do ABC. Government shall not stop me from 
you're practicing my religion. Government cannot stop my free speech. So that is an element that sometimes eludes most people when they are writing constitutions. You write constitutions that fit that elite writing that constitution for that period. But constitutions should be written for the future. Constitution should be the bedrock of each country. And the constitution framers must know that the temptation to write a constitution that addresses their needs is always going to be strong. So let governments be, but governments should not be authoritarian because it's very easy to have authoritarian governments when people are in power. Mm -hmm. Now, the question about the military, the military as it should be an institution within the, 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 the framework of governance, but it's an institution that is below the civilian leadership. The civilian leadership is going to instruct the military to do its job of protecting the country against foreign and domestic threats. So, so, so that's, yeah, that's the role of what somebody. Here's what somebody says. Hello, Chartered Africa. This is the voice of Labour Bonifo. I'm actually recording this message from uh, Bowie, Maryland. Uh, I just wanted to contribute to the topic of today. Um, that's uh, military interventions in Africa, or what we call the military coup d'etat. And I would like to think that the people of Guinea are actually jubilating in the streets because a dictator has fallen. Let me start by sounding this very, very seriously. Dictators are not only in uniform. All over French Africa, we have a lot of dictators in power who appear to be civilians, but they are actually military in, in the way they act. Look at, for example, in Cameroon, we have a military court where civilians are tried in military court. So how is Cameroon different from a military rule? Look at the way the military is actually causing mayhem on the streets of Bamenda, uh, Buya, Kumba, Menchum, everywhere, all over the southern Cameroons. So how is Cameroon different? Can we say Cameroon is not a military system? Can we talk about countries where the military too, the military too are known to have paved the way for peace, the development and, 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 and tranquility? We have so many countries where people were helpless. In some of these countries, the leaders have manipulated the constitutions for close to 40 years. There's no exit strategy. The leaders have no political timetable. They are just there. The people are helpless. The political opposition, opposition is divided. The political opposition is weak. They don't have access to resources. And the incumbents continue to stay, to hang on to power. So there's no way these leaders can be taken out of power except the military intervene. And I'm sure Cam Cameroonians should be praying, going to bed every night, praying for the military to do something in Cameroon. Do you know why I know this? Because there are so many instances where it's been rumored that the president of Cameroon died and Cameroonians were drinking their lives in, on the streets. You know what? These Cameroonians are jubilating, praying, jubilating that the president died when he did not die. That's going to tell you that they will welcome a military intervention whenever it happens. But unfortunately, in the case of Cameroon, the military has been hijacked. The military, the military has been hijacked by the by, by, by the president. He has tribalized the military. He has politicized it. You know why? After 1983, 1984, when Bia's life was threatened, Bia went into his shelves. So for close to 40 years, the one thing Bia has achieved is to perpetrate his stay in power. Bia became more obscure. Bia went into his shelves. He encapsulated himself with a series of strategies. The Republican Guard was neutralized and the Presidential Guard was created to take care of himself and family. Let's again cite the case of let's cite the case of Nigeria. If you look at Nigeria today, the foundations of Nigeria's development were laid by the military leaders who ruled that country. Let's cite the cases of Yakubu Gowon, Mutala, Mohane, Med, uh, whether it was uh, Buari, whether it was uh, Babangida, most of these leaders were the, the architects of the modern day Nigeria. Even it was Babangida who transferred the capital from uh, Lagos to Abuja. 
It was also under the reign of Abacha that Nigeria, under the umbrella of Ekomok, was able to, to intervene in the political crisis in, I think that was Liberia or Sierra Leone. That was under the, 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 the leadership of uh, a military rule, uh, 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 Sani Abacha. Okay, let's talk about Chad. Chad has had the military rule for close to 12 years before the, the recent death of uh, Idris Debi. We remember the fight against Boko Haram has been dominated by Chad under a military rule. The civilian governments in the Lake Chad Basin area, they have all failed. Cameroon has failed. Uh, Niger has failed. Central African Republic, all the other countries have failed. It's only Chad, the most formidable strength against Boko Haram has been orchestrated by Chad under Idris Debi, being himself a leader in uniform. So we cannot keep thinking that each time we, we talk about military intervention, we, we, the first thing to think is that they will institute martial law, they will censor the press, they will curtail basic freedoms. Oh yeah, that will happen. But let's also look at the other side. To look at side where, uh, the other side where some of these military rulers have actually led their countries to more development, more peace than the so-called civilian rulers. Because the civilian rulers, they, they, what, what they, they do is to deceive the international community and solicit aid. That's all they do. Fly in planes and live in Switzerland for three months and come back, giving the impression that the country is fine, whereas we all know that they, their countries are not fine. Let me cite another example of where the militaries have actually worked than the civilians. A few years after independence, Nigeria was almost disintegrating. Remember the Biafran War? It was because those countries had a string of military rules that the country was held together. Another example is Congo. In 1964, Katanga declared independence. Katanga was seceding, the country was disintegrating. And I'm, I would like to tell you it was the coming to power of uh, Mobutu that held the country together. I'm not saying that I want, I'm trying to applaud some of these military rules uh, leaders, but I'm just trying to let you know that we cannot completely paint all military interventions with, with one brush because there are so many cases. There are so many cases where some of these military rules, they have actually done the work in a few years. Most of the militaries, military interventions, when they come in, they'll spend a few years and they will fight against corruption. They will fight against tribalism. They will fight against nepotism. When the conditions are right, they will pave the way for elections and they'll exit. There are cases like that. Again, look at Cameroon. Ever since multi-party politics was reintroduced in Cameroon in, in 1990, there have been several attempts. The, the, the opposition is divided. They are weak. They don't have access to information. They don't have access to state infrastructure. Because the government, with all the money, they monopolize everything. So let me, let me go to bed by thinking that a military intervention is what Cameroonians are waiting and praying for. Because what Cameroonians need is change. Even though I say so, and I acknowledge the fact that it's not every change that is good, but what I know is that Cameroonians need change. Thank you, sir. Uh, <laughs> where did you tell that? Somebody said, be careful what you ask for, you might not like what you get. When... I, I, in some in, in some ways, the caller says, well, it's good for military interventions. The, the militaries, they do what civilians don't do. Um, what's your reaction to that? And then we'll soon wrap up. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Abegano. Yes. You, you heard him. You heard, yes, you heard the guy. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> the because guy after listening to him, I'm tempted to say, again, let me repeat the yes. thermal statement. Be careful what you ask for. You may not like what you get. Yes, uh, he is saying that uh, we are not brushing all in the same with the same brush. What we are saying is that when we are talking about democracy, uh, military intervention is not the solution. It's just a bandage. And uh, if the military, those are the junta come to came, come to power and uh, they trying to um, bring about change, that can be welcome. Nobody uh, in Africa, across the continent now, especially in the Francophone Africa, we are, we are not going to see um, any democratic attention if there's no 
uh, military intervention that everybody know that for fact now. Um, but uh, the problem we are facing in Africa is that it's a lack of a political will. If someone who take a power via military coup, coup d'etat have a political will to step down assist after six months, after six years, after whatever they said that they are going to do, and after that time they, they step aside, that's a, that's a good thing to do. But the problem, we lack political will, both from the civilian and also from the military. That's what is a, a characteristic of African leadership, political leadership and military leadership. That cannot move democracy. As a way forward, we need to have a, a political will and see a political will from the, from the base, from our primary education. Tell our children what needs to, to be done you need to live up to your word. Now, let, if let's, we cannot do because that, we're going to wrap up, Paris. We're going to wrap up, Dr. Ben Bonga. One minute, then I'll bring you back for your closing. Statement. Yes, I think. Uh, oh, Dr. Ben Bonga, the question we're going to ask you kind of, kind of relates to what the caller just said. Today in Conakry, we saw people dancing in the streets. Yeah. And I can mm -hmm. suspect that in countries where you have dictatorial, you don't have democratic governments. People will be wishing, oh my goodness, we are praying, why is it happening elsewhere and not happening to us? Should Africans, even if they are going through undemocratic governance, be praying for military takeover, knowing or not knowing what these men in uniform are coming to do? No, they shouldn't. The tragedy of the continent is when you see people jubilating when, because the military is taking over power. That is, to me, the tragedy of the continent. It is the measure of desperation that you see all across the continent because we have failed after since the 1960s with the independence, failed to create democratic institutions that would bring people in our different countries out of, of poverty, out of backwardness that remains. The civilians have hijacked countries and in desperation the military come now and again and take over and in most cases repeat what the civilian leadership had done or worse do that so the path to democracy can never be in my opinion through the military thank you sir we'll be coming right back for your closing remarks time for us to visit a village in cameroon english-speaking cameroon called oku we have a traditional dance troupe, I call them the sensations of Oko. Watch this and we'll bring back our guest for their closing remarks. Here we go.
Africa at Chat Might. My name is Sir Divine Chamakong. I'm anchoring this broadcast from Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Time for us to bring back our guest on the platform for their closing remarks. First, Professor Ben Bongan on the platform. You are closing remarks, sir. Yes, I think uh, what happened today in Guinea is unfortunate. Is probably taking the country back. Uh, and the hope is that the military, the group that has taken power can, uh, you know, find ways to build, you know, to talk with, with the leaders, whether they are some of the leaders who are outgoing or some leaders of institutions in the country to figure a way forward, a more democratic way forward for the country. But I have not lost hope on the continent yet. Uh, recently, there was a glimmer of hope from Zambia, where we saw a relatively peaceful transfer of power. So let's hope that uh, examples like the Zambian example can be consolidated made so that other countries can emulate and begin to build constitutions that are not constitutions for those who are alive today but that constitutions then can stand the test of time and make the, the people proud and address the fundamental problems of development on the continent and give people pride in their different countries on the continent. Thank you, uh, Professor Ben Bonga. And now we bring for his closing remarks, Professor Edu Abegano. Let's hear what he has as closing remarks. Uh, Dr. Yes. Uh, uh Thank you so much for uh, this opportunity um, to learn from each other and to help uh, our continent to move forward. And uh, to close, I will say that uh, what we need to do uh, for a democracy to emerge and solve and consolidate, Ted, we need to learn from history. Learn from history. I mean that and uh, if, uh, on a serious note. Uh, what happened in Guinea today, if uh, Alpha Conde, Professor Alpha Conde learned from history, he's not, he's, he's not going to be the one who will be overthrown today um, in that manner. Uh, because uh, his predecessors, uh, um, Daji Kamara, who overthrew uh, Alpha Conde, also was overthrown because he uh, enjoyed being in power and being represented, uh, extend his uh, um, term when uh, uh, he they have not uh, that uh, um, allow when he was not uh, supposed to uh, extend his uh, his term like that. So learn from history is very important. So other leaders across the continent need to learn that. Uh, the second one is a political will. We need to have political will across the term saying that uh, we are here, we are not there for us, we are there for the people we are called to govern. We have also to acknowledge the challenge that uh, political leaders, uh, African political leaders, especially Francophone African political leaders face today. The nationalists face only one problem. The only problem they face is the colonial masters. But African political leaders face a twofold problem. problem. One is uh, the neo-colonialism, and the, next, the, 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 the second one is uh, themselves. That's the problem. So in order to be democratic, we need to make sure that we are free from political uh, intervention. We are free from uh, corruption. We are free from neo-colonialism. That is uh, very, very, very important. And so one minute, leaders, again, one minute uh, to conclude. We are running out of time. Yes. Yes, what happened today should not happen if we follow our, our country, our leaders follow their constitution. And uh, if you have a, uh, an eye on what's happening, it's happened most frequently in the Francophone Africa. So colonial policy also have to play a role. We cannot ignore that in what's going on today. It's play a key role in what's going on in uh, in uh, Guinea today. So other leaders need to learn from it. Otherwise, we are going to have a debacle in uh, um, other country as uh, our the one who left our video suggested. 
And uh, the last but not least, um, they have to have a, a constitutional mand mandated um, line of succession as we have here in, uh, in the United States and uh, have to have political will to follow those succession, uh, the line of succession. Uh, so uh, in order to avoid dynasty. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sirs. I should say, Professor um, Edu Abeganu and Professor Ben Bongan, eminent professors of political science, one of political science and journalism, and then the other one specializing in conflict management, international, international mediation, and so on. Have you ever heard the statement, ignorance of the law is no excuse? Well, next Sunday, you and the law, and we've looked for one of the best legal minds in the United States of African descent, that's uh, lawyer Aneneba Akufo. He will be answering some very challenging questions regarding the law in the United States. If you live in the United States, you ought to pay attention. While you are not required to go to a law school, you cannot find yourself on the wrong side of the law and in court you say, well, I did not know I broke the law. Sorry, you'll be walked out of court into a jail cell in handcuffs. That's why you ought to pay attention to the broadcast this same time next Sunday, you and the law with lawyer Aneneba Akufo as our guest. My name is Divine Chiamukon. Thank you all for watching. It's been wonderful. You can watch this broadcast on our website. It's there on our website. It's on our YouTube channel. Our website is www.chatnightafrica.net. And our YouTube channel is Chat Night Africa. I want to thank you all for spending part of your time with us on Voices of Africa at Chat Night. Good night to everyone and have a blessed week ahead. Bye now. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. Coming to get down. I'm coming. I'm coming. Coming to dance. To dance. We're gonna dance. We're gonna dance. We're gonna get down. We're gonna get down. We're gonna party. Party hard. We're gonna book it. Book it, book it. And when we jam, it's out of sight. This song right here, it's dynamite. I'm ready.